we'll repaint the tender when the locomotive is painted, and then we will uh, uh, we will hand do it the way the railroad did it. And the problem is, the paint is seventy five dollars a quart because it's Ooh. silver. It's not quart. <laughs> But yes, we're waiting for you. You'll, you'll have nothing to complain about when those letters are correctly done. But they make it look finished to the to the uninformed, and uh, that's that's got an attraction on itself. It runs. We've had it several different places. The locomotive was going to be next, and I that's where we just... actually built the model. Of that. Did you? Yeah. Cool. We'll have to see it sometime. Yeah. Anyway, the uh, uh, the firebox turned out to be monstrously dirty. This is the first guy ever to get a pig pen patch. <laughs> he deserved it. Cleaning it out uh, was a, a big job. Uh, the asbestos was worse. <clears throat> we investigated the possibility of training our own guys up to the OSHA standards for doing asbestos work. You can't do it. I mean, it's just really hard, particularly with volunteers who sometimes don't feel like coming today. We found a company here in town that agreed to do the work for us. Uh, when their crews would be idle and just sitting around the yard, and they would do the work for the wages of the, the guys that did it and their, and their costs. So they didn't make a dime off. So instead of spending $65,000 for the asbestos payment, we did $30,000. But it took six months because they'd call and say, well, we don't have anything to do Tuesday. We'd like to work. And we'd say, gosh, I guess that would be convenient. Sure, when do you want us there? <laughs> and uh, it's properly gone now down by Mountaineer somewhere in the only land <coughs> that uh, is available for that sort of thing. That got us down to where the problems were because basically underneath that asbestos was rusted and rusted and rusted and steel. And that if this had been left in a building, it would have been done years ago. Been fighting rust ever since. Bottom of the cab was rusted out, we plucked it off with a whole frame, rebuilt the bottom, and relined it with the same kind of wood that the Santa Fe used and painted it the same yuck green that the Santa Fe painted things. And uh, Got it hand lettered with the appropriate fonts. This is the same artist who's going to do the, the tender for us. And along the way, we've learned basically in this line of work with a, a thinly resourced all volunteer operation, you got to pretty much solve your own problems. Nobody comes through and does it for you. Once again, one of our civil engineers designed the pit, fabricated, so we've got a place to work under the locomotive uh, with good stout track. But there's just way too many things you've got to do underneath the locomotive you can't do laying on your back. Uh, one of the jobs that I was in charge of was the ultrasound, which we'll talk about in several passes here. When you, yes sir? Michael, how much does the whole locomotive weigh? Um, the way the Santa Fe weighed it was, was with a two-thirds load of fuel and water and it's a bit of out. But you have to take the word for it. They were actually uh, forced to pay by union agreements. They had to pay their crews by the weight of the locomotive. And the more the locomotive weighed, the more they had to pay per hour. So there is a, 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 a rumor that won't go away that they under-reported the actual weight of their machines. Who's going to call them? I can't. So this thing. This is a pressure vessel. This is a steel structure which holds about 6,000 gallons of water that's being heated by a fire uh, burning on the order of 2300 degrees Fahrenheit and it's at 300 pounds per square inch. Uh, water at 300 pounds per square inch is going to be about 400 degrees Fahrenheit. That pressure vessel can't leak and it better not explode. <laughs> if uh, in, when these things were actually operating, boiler explosions would kill everybody who was standing within 100 feet of the thing for sure. You would never even know it happened. Uh, if you come to the site, I'll show you where the boiler would land after an explosion, and it's all the way to 12th Street. Uh, the, the FRA has been writing rules about safety since before the Civil War. So they had a lot of time to work on them, and they've gotten better and better and better, and they've learned more and more and more the hard way. Uh, and they have, like any good inspector, they're not your friends, they're your inspectors, and they have a purpose which is basically ensuring that this uh, steel structure will not blow up. It, it is your excellent, perfect example, and a failure and corrective action is how this standard was developed. Over and over again. Over yeah, it's and got over a lot over of refinements. Over again. The, the modern refinement on certifying, uh, making a, you're familiar with the concept of a boiler car. Uh, if you go to the university and there's a steam heating plant, 
and there's a boiler in there somewhere, there is a boiler card. Uh, ASME will tell you what its characteristics have to be to operate at a certain pressure safely, and it needs to be inspected and certified. Well, the equivalent of a boiler card in railroad talk is called Form 4, and a lot of the data that goes into it requires you knowing everything there is to know about each sheet of metal, which Baldwin Locomotive Works in 1944 knew what they bought. When they got it from the steel yard, they knew how thick it was, they knew how much carbon was in it, they knew how much trace elements were in it. They had all that stuff. Guess what? Those records don't exist. So, you got to do it for yourself. The first thing is, we know there's a lot of rusting, there's a lot of pitting that's obvious. Uh, is it below <laughs> safe levels? The way you discover this is that there are 47 separate sheets of metal that are rolled and formed into this boiler inside and out. And we wound up making mechanical drawings of them that wouldn't fit on that table very well, of each sheet, taking a grid from that and applying it to the locomotive. Uh, depending on where you are, the grid's either one foot squares or eight inch squares, or in some cases four inches and two inches. And then you go back with a little flapper wheel and you make a little mirror polish finish on the surface at the intersection, and you apply a little ultrasound gizmo, which is basically like taking candy from a baby from my point of view, uh, except we had to do it more than 7,000 times and document all of those measurements so that they could be inspected. It also allowed us to find, here's, here's an example of one of the maps. Uh, with the, in mills, the uh, thickness written for each intersection, inside and out. Remember, on the inside of the firebox, you're actually looking at the inner hull. Uh, when you're standing outside the locomotive, you're looking at an outer hull. At the bottom, they're about that far apart. When you get to the top, up over the top of the fire, they're more like three feet apart. It's a very interesting geometry. I'll show you more of that in a minute which meant we rapidly tumbled to places that were too thin to hold pressure. We got yellow is bad and red is worse, and that allowed us to establish places that had to be mapped and carefully cut out. Holding those two sheets of metal uh, uh, at, at a fixed distance are a pattern of bolts that are on a little bit less than a four inch grid. Those bolts are called stay bolts. Uh, some of them are rigid stay bolts and others are flexible. When the, they're flexible, they're sitting in a sleeve with a round head and they're allowed to wiggle a little bit. Wiggling is better than breaking. This locomotive gains one inch in length when it comes to temperature uh, ready to operate. So cutting out all the stay bolts, by the way, you had to cut them on the inside as well, and then extracting that bad sheet of rusted out metal meant that we were able to wrench out the stay bolts and leave a gaping hole in the side of the boiler, you see the inside there, and then go back and fabricate a new piece of steel which had to match the metallurgy of the steel that was removed and chamfer out all the holes. We used a welded stay rod repair technique instead of a threaded stay bolt. It's a, it's a legal boiler repair. It turns out there's two ways to skin the cat and the FRA doesn't care what you do. We thought we'd do the easy one. It turns out it was anything but easy uh, to prepare all these holes and then get the welding done. Now the fascinating thing about the welding to me was um, I gained a ton of respect for the people who can do that kind of work. I'm not a welder. I've become a respecter of welders. Uh, the thing that I saw, and this is just for fun, we'll weld for food. Um, they actually are welding free. They'd make 75 bucks an hour if we were paying them. Anybody ever seen a 6G test? What a pain in the ass. They give the guy a slice from a six inch pipe fixed on a, on a bracket at 45 degrees, you see that cross shape thing. You give him another piece and say, weld them together so that it's one piece of pipe, starting with a, a, a root weld and then working their way up to make a full penetration weld. There's a visual inspection process that's, that's done and if it passes that, then you take this new single piece of pipe and you cut what they call coupons out of it in four separate places and you put them in a press and you bend two of them this way and you bend two of them the other way and any, any of them break, he can't work on your project. He just won the 6G test. And you send him back to the union hall and ask for somebody else. Uh, the fascinating thing to me is this is like me having to take a board examination to work at every hospital I've ever been to. I mean, I thought taking it once was a royal pain in the ass. I can't imagine taking it in front of every job I've ever done but our welders had to do 6G tests on site for us. Uh, 